All right, in video two here from chapter 15, we're gonna have a little bit of a thought transition from solubility product into building yet another type of K that we'll get to the beginning of video three. Okay, we're working towards KF, which is a formation constant. But to get there, we first have to learn about a third and final class of acids and bases. Our original definition of acids and bases was the Arrhenius definition, which we learned in Gen Chem 1. Then in chapter 14, we got the Bronsted-Lowry definition of acids and bases. Yep. And then the Lewis acids and base definition takes us a little bit further. Okay, it's named after this guy, G.M. Lewis. Yep. And the reason that it's not like we're gonna violate anything that was said in Bronsted-Lowry, okay, it just ha is more all-encompassing, the Lewis acid-base definition. Yep. Because not every acid-base reaction actually has to do with proton transfer. Yep. If we're thinking about proton transfer strictly, we can cover that with the Bronsted-Lowry definition, but sometimes there are acid-base interactions where that's not the case. Yep. So the Lewis definition of acids and bases centers around electron pairs and forming what's known as a coordinate covalent bond, which is an important vocabulary word from this section, a coordinate covalent bond. That's formed when we're forming a covalent bond, right? So the electrons are still being shared, but when that bond is formed, one of the two atoms that's making up the bond contributes both of the electrons. So unlike a standard covalent bond, like if we're forming a single bond, each participant in that bond contributes one electron. Two total, they make up the bond. That's a standard covalent bond. A coordinate covalent bond, one of the two atoms gives up both of the electrons, the other one gave up zero. Okay. And that is what happens when a base picks up a proton. Okay. So like I said, it's not violating what we've said before, it's just changing up the definition. Okay. So look right here. When I would take water, Right? and it picks up a proton H plus in solution to form hydronium, what's happening? That pair of electrons is now forming a coordinate covalent bond. And we see the same thing down here with ammonia picking up a proton to form ammonium. This pair of electrons both went in to form this bond, the coordinate covalent bond. So with that thought and thinking about these coordinate covalent bonds, Okay, we can define acids and bases in a little bit of a different way. We think about a Lewis acid as any species that can possibly accept a pair of electrons, okay? whereas a Lewis base is something that can donate a pair of electrons. Okay? So those are really important definitions to know here, and they'll really be critical if you're continuing on into organic chemistry, thinking about these things. Uh, now, Lewis acids, Lewis's bases, they could be molecules, they could be ions, all sorts of things. We're just looking at what they can possibly do. If it can possibly accept a pair of electrons, it's a Lewis acid. If it can possibly donate a lone pair of electrons, it's a Lewis base. Yep. When those two come together, the product that's formed is known as a Lewis acid-based adduct. Yep. So a compound that contains a coordinate covalent bond that was newly formed between a Lewis acid and a Lewis base. So let's look at a couple of examples to determine those. Yep. Here I've got fluoride coming together with BF3. Yep. And again, we're, for these molecules, we're typically thinking about the center atom. So this is the Lewis acid base adduct. We know that, that that's the product that formed. There's the new coordinate covalent bond. So how did it form? Fluoride here contributed the pair of electrons to form the new coordinate covalent bond. And because fluoride donated the electrons, it must be the Lewis base, whereas BF3 is the Lewis acid. Hopefully that makes sense. If not, here's another one to practice. Think about this to yourself. Okay, pause the video and try and identify the Lewis acid, the Lewis base, and the Lewis acid base adduct. Okay. When they come together, that's the adduct. That's the easy one. Okay, but think to yourself, what's the Lewis acid? What's the Lewis base? In the formation of these new coordinate covalent bonds, okay, silver didn't contribute anything. It doesn't have any electrons. Okay? 
ammonia is contributing the pair of electrons to form the coordinate covalent bond. Therefore, ammonia is acting as the Lewis base, silver is the Lewis acid, together coming together to form an adduct. Okay. One more to think about. Okay. Again, we form the adduct. Here, oxygen is acting as the Lewis base, SO3 as the Lewis acid. Which is not to say that Lewis acid and base reactions are always forming an adduct. Sometimes they can be displacement reactions, like we have here, right? We could be kicking things off. But notice at the end of the day, note from the bottom down here, right? Our Lewis definition of acids and bases does not contradict the Bronsted Lowry definition, right? We would have known this reaction down here. Right, from chapter 14, HCl, a strong acid with water, forms hydronium and chloride. Right? Looking at my strong acid, conjugate base. Okay? Base, conjugate acid. That's all old stuff we would have already been able to do with the bronsted lowry definition. But now we just think about it a little bit differently with Lewis to look at electron pairs. Okay? So for acids, if you want to compare the two, an acid is a bronsted lowry proton donor, but an acid is a Lewis electron pair acceptor. Whereas if it's the bronsted lowry definition, a base is a proton acceptor. In the Lewis definition, a base is an electron pair donor. So basically it boils down to, are you dealing with protons or electron pairs and then donating or accepting switches depending on the definition. Okay. Now we can relate, you know, where this information here, 15.2 to the rest of the chapter, solubility in KSP due to the formation of complex ions. Okay, so we're jumping to think about this guy, again, that we just saw previously. But the formation of this complex ion can affect the solubility of silver on its own. So that's why we talked about Lewis acids and bases, because thinking about silver just on its own, right, that will have its own KSP in solution. But now if I have NH3 in solution, it can form a complex ion with silver. And that could cause it to end up being more soluble in solution. Okay, thinking about silver chloride, it's sparingly soluble. So I can consider just the reaction on the top from 15.1 if I'm thinking about KSP. But now if I have ammonia in solution, I know that that can form a complex ion, introducing equilibrium number two here, okay? So by forming that complex ion, that's pulling some of this silver out of solution. So think about Le Chatelier's principle, this concentration is going down, meaning the reaction will be shifting right and making silver chloride more soluble. So I have to net consider the reaction as a whole, okay? And everything that's going on. Here's another example with mercury. Yep. If I'm trying to increase the solubility here of mercury to sulfide, okay, well, I have to think about complex ions that could be added. And this is kind of trippy to think about, right? because looking at just the equilibrium at the top there, right, that's thinking about the KSP, and I would think, okay, if I increase the amount of sulfide there, S2 minus, that would make it less soluble, shift it left. But if you think about the formation of a complex ion that can happen, again, if you look at the net reaction here, you can see that adding sulfide shifts right. So if it's possible to form a complex ion in solution, we have to make sure we consider all the reactions together, the net result, and how the Chatelier's principle can tie into these things. So that is where we're gonna leave off and then immediately pick back up at the beginning of video three, okay? the formation of complex ions, which is a subset of Lewis acid and base chemistry. Okay? We'll talk about this more in chapter 13, uh, we'll call it coordination chemistry there, but it has to do with these same complex ions. Yeah. The complex ions, these coordination compounds, okay, 
typically contain a metal center atom. It can be other things, but nine times out of 10, we're dealing with a metal in the middle surrounded by ions or molecules that are bonded to it via coordinate covalent bonds. That's why it's called a coordination complex. But another name for those ions or molecules that are attached to the metal, jumping back a slide here, jump three sides, like we have here, metal in the middle, molecules attached to it, those are called ligands. So here I've got two NH3 ligands that are bonded to silver. They can be neutral or negatively charged. And the ligands are Lewis bases that bond to the metal in the middle. The metal is the Lewis acid. And you know these things are discovered experimentally. Of course, they would be told to you on a quiz or a test, an exam or homework. But I just want to introduce that idea now. Ligands can form, or sorry, coordination compounds can form with a metal and a ligand. And we will have one final equilibrium in chapter 15 called a KF for the formation of these coordination compounds. Okay, but we'll save that information for our final video from chapter 15 and cover that in part three.